This evening on The Rock Newman Show, we'll explore how a local fine arts program for DC youth, Blacks and Wax, is showcasing the best in black culture while also transforming lives. That's coming up right now on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to the Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University, located in the nation's capital. I'm Rock Newman, and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. Created in 2006 by the Recreation Wish List Committee, Blacks and Wax is a living history program showcasing DC youth who depict black historical figures in original onstage productions. Blacks and Wax combines music, drama, and dance, and has wowed audiences at the White House, the Kennedy Center, and throughout the D.C. metro area. Joining me now to discuss more about this unique and transformative program are founder and chief executive officer of the Recreation Wish List Committee, Core Masters Barry, and Blacks and Wax director and writer, Sheba Haley. Ladies, welcome to The Rock Newman Show. Thank you so much for being here, both of you. Um, Cora, let me ask you, because you're a founding member of the Recreation Wish List Committee. Mm, uh, I'm the founder. Yeah, you're the founder. Mm -hmm. The founder. The founder. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I remember people like, little known people like Hillary Clinton being involved in that. Right, very But you much. were the founder. Right. Okay. Sure. Um, before we go to some of these vignettes, which I'm just like a kid, too excited, can't wait to get to them, I'd like for you to share what your vision was early on in the formation of the uh, uh, Southeast Tennis and Learning Center as you all created the Recreation Wish List Committee. Well, it was reversed. The Recreation Wish List Committee was founded out of the inaugural funds, left over inaugural from, from my husband, Mary and Barry's fourth term as mayor. And uh, we wanted to just provide recreation and education around the city for kids, especially in underserved communities which means we had a heavy emphasis on east of the river ward seven and eight. And doing that, we looked and saw that there was a need for, well, tennis courts. And so we built some in Southeast Washington and the kids played on them for a couple of years. And it became very clear that, edu that education needed to be coupled with recreation, that tennis wasn't going to be enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, whoever lost got beat up on the corner. And so that was, <laughs> that was the opposite of what the game was supposed to be about. <laughs> right. So came up with the vision. Uh, well, I always say God gave me a vision to build a building. And so we built the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center to supplement and help change the trajectory of a lot of the kids in the community and in the city with tennis being the hook and education being the key. And you all are sticklers that if they're going to come in there and participate in the recreation aspect, that they must bring the education with them or accept the education that you all are providing? Oh, they have to participate in the education part of it, and they have to keep their grades up if they're going to get on the court. Okay. So what we have here today, folks, the viewing audience, just stay in your seat because we got some exciting stuff going on. Uh, there is a program that uh, Cora and Sheba are very much a part of called Blacks and Wax. And what that is, is you'll see part of what it is here. First thing I want to introduce is um, up first, we have, I'm going to give you the kids' names, is Kelvin Jackson, Reginald Green, Jalen Morris, Craig Jones, and Cameron Jones playing New Edition. Take it away, guys. Mr. Telephone Man, it's all through my line. Oh, wait, I didn't see you guys in. We were all born in Roxbury Projects in Boston, Massachusetts. Just four kids that wanted to sing and dance. In 1978, Bobby convinced me, Mike, and Ricky to perform in a local talent show. We won, of course. Yep, Bobby, we won. We brought in Ronnie, which made five and started making music. We ruled the airways in the 1980s. We was like Candy Girl, Mr. Telephone Man, and Cooler Now. It all happened so fast and in no time. 
We went from local talent shows to our first major record deal. But we were young and not eager to the business. Our first post tour check was only for $8.87. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. I was voted out the group in 1985. So I started my own solo career and was known as the king of R&B. We continued for a little while, just the four of us. But in 1988, we recruited singer Johnny Gill. He was from right here in Washington, D.C. Johnny was the perfect addition to the group. But by 1990, we all decided to do our own thing. Me, Mike, and Ronnie formed a group called Bell. Bell DeVoe. Now, now you know. know. We sure did, Ricky. And our debut album sold over four million copies. And the title track, Poison, reached number one on Billboard's R&B and Hip Hop charts. We continued to tour as a group and most recently performed the Love and Happiness Obama celebration at the White House. Ralph and Johnny were successful in their solo careers as well. We all reunited in 2011 to celebrate our 30th anniversary of Candy Girl. We all received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. You, messing out three-part docu-series. You know us? We're, We're a new edition. edition. Cool it down. Ooh, watch out. I, Sheba, I begged Cora to allow Janice, your designer over there, to make me one of those new edition costumes, and she just refused to do it. And Rock, if you can't dance a little better than you did the other day with Debbie Allen, nobody wants to be bothered. Oh, that's low. I'm that, sorry. You just hit beneath the table right there. <laughs> well, it's the truth. <laughs> Sheba, writer, director of Blacks and Wax, you have these kids, and part of what I'm familiar with is they are very raw. This is not the kind of thing that they've done before. Can you tell me a little bit about the process of taking those undiscovered, those raw elements over there and turn them into a jewel like we just saw? Uh, yes, it is a, it's a pretty arduous process, uh, and especially for the kids because they uh, come in there generally, some of them want to do it, some of their parents want them to do it more than they want to do it initially. Mm -hmm. So we have to get them to get their confidence up, mm -hmm. uh, get them to kind of really work on their diction mm -hmm. and memorization. Memorization is usually the easiest part. Mm -hmm. Then once they memorize, now we want them to do some character study. We want them to like become more of that person, mm -hmm. you know, and to understand the words that we're saying. Because a lot of times the writing is um, different because I, a lot of times it's biblical, you know, big uh, biography. So uh -huh. we're taking the bi biographical sketches yeah. and trying to turn them into this is who I am, this is who I'm portraying. Uh, in the vignettes, we did more uh, taking speeches this time. Yeah. So it's like taking these speeches so the words are authentic to the actual person. Mm -hmm. And they've got to now understand those words. So Mr. Barry and I, we work back and forth to make sure that they understand the words that they're saying and the feeling of what they're supposed to be portraying. Any particular stories within sort of the story of the new edition where either if any of the kids had more difficulty than not a lack of confidence, but you saw confidence, you know, grow as time went by? Well, first of all, new edition is uh, uh, as a result, it came about as a result of the demise of the Supremes. Yeah. Every year we've had the Supremes, and every year they broke up like they did the original team. Uh -huh. And I was just supreme weary. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody came over. Now that's died. a backstory right there. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a gossipy backstory, <laughs> right. right? You was tired of the women. I was just tired of them. <laughs> and so uh, wigs would be crooked. They would be mad with each other. It was just got to be too much. <laughs> so they came up with a new edition because you know they're they're it's. New, they yeah, just the current, the, the new movie they just came out. And, and when I first popular. saw them, I really had tears in my eyes because these are five boys who could be doing other stuff, and they're at the age where they're getting ready to do other stuff. Mm -hmm. But they were so committed and uh -huh. and and invested in and in learning this and learning their part. So mm -hmm. I was very excited about it. And each and every one of them has their own little Bobby Brown story. Uh -huh. So this is sort of the, the hammer we've held over their head. We're gonna kick you out the group if you don't <laughs> do better in school. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That is, that, w watching them perform that and sort of, sort of the polish yeah. that they yeah. had come up with, you know, we came to, my family and I came to one of the, um, one of the showings 
of blacks and wax. And interestingly enough, uh, one of my nephews is married to a white sister. She is a school teacher. And when we left the performance, I asked everybody in the car with me, we bought a, we bought a big crew. Yeah, you had a band. <laughs> and I asked everybody to talk about their favorite part. And she was describing her favorite part and she teared up. She said, being a teacher, I know what it means for these kids to come from a very basic sort of lack of understanding of this subject matter. And then to be able to have to, un because you can't perform like they perform without understanding. So one, giving them that kind of understanding of a historical perspective, one, and then two, giving them the confidence that they can do something that perhaps they never imagined they can do mm -hmm. can change their lives. Well, it, it changes the trajectory. I always say they start with, I can't, I won't. Yeah. And to what you see on stage. And that right there changes them for life because it changes their sense of self, their confidence, and their self-esteem. And that is actually, for 11 years, the story every single time. And that some of them come back the next yeah, year. Yeah. So they might have, the year before, they've portrayed something. And yeah. we were pulling and prodding to get it out. Yeah. And the next year they come, they get better. Cause, and what it gives, it gives them, them the they know that it's something. It, yes. it's, it's a fuel. It's, yes. it's a food that helps them grow. That's right. They run for office in school. They're only ones in school. Not shame to get up. And, it does so much for them. Mm -hmm. It yeah. really does change their life. That is why we do it. Yeah. Because of what it does for them. I think I know the right order here. Um, I have been a proponent uh, and plagiarized since the time I was in uh, probably about my junior year in high school when I've uttered the phrase, I'm sick and tired of being <laughs> sick and tired. And of course, that comes from Fannie Lou Hammer, who, Fannie Lou Hammer, and she is being depicted by Jumaya Lewis. Take it away. The plantation owner told me to withdraw my application to vote. I told him, I ain't go down there to register for you. I went down there to register for myself. After living and working there for 18 years, they kicked me off the plantation. They set me free. It's the best thing that could have happened. Now, I can work for my own people. I was able to dedicate my life to the fight for civil rights. So I started by working with the Student Nonviolent Coordinator Committee. In a SNCC meeting, I told them, if we're trying to break down this barrier of segregation, we can't segregate ourselves. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I ask, is this America the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to go to sleep with our phones off the hook because our lives are threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? Now, little Miss Jemiah there, it is my understanding, you know, we, we do some research here. Mm -hmm. She had, um, this was a journey for her. Mm -hmm. And the journey from her going from when she first heard about Fannie Lou Hamer mm -hmm. to when she became Fannie Lou Hamer, mm -hmm. there was an aha moment. Either one of you care to well, share that? one of the Saturdays, right before the performance, Saturday the week before the performance, we do what we call peer critiques. And this year we put some of the video up of some of the characters so the other kids could see them and so the person could see them. And this particular time the video wasn't working but the audio was. And it was Fannie Lou Hamer describing when they were thrown in jail and the bleeding and the blood in the jail. The real voice the of real Fannie The real voice. Lou uh -huh. And she was describing it. Mm -hmm. And after it, this girl had a breakdown and I said, what happened? And she said, I felt the pain. And from that point on, she went right into it because she really heard, didn't even see it, but heard what mm -hmm. Fannie Lou Hamer was talking about in terms of threats to her life, in terms of being sick and tired and being threatened because all they wanted to do was vote. You know, I, I, I'm gonna take the risk of treating this particular subject here, Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, and talk to me like dummy 101 um, if one of you care to go back to that moment, I think it was in Atlantic City, 
when the Democratic Convention was taking place. And it's when sort of the world became aware of Fannie Lou Hamm. I know you are the uh, social, you're, historian. She's the so, you're the social scientist. She's our historian on this. You want to take us back there for a moment? Well, actually, it's interesting because Johnson didn't want yeah. to be on TV. Mm -hmm. So he went to the press room and had a press conference on nothing mm -hmm. to keep the cameras off Fannie Lou Hamer, who was speaking to the Rules Committee about seating the Democratic uh, alternates, mm -hmm. uh, black people, on uh, as delegates. Mm -hmm. And that is when she really used that term, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. And the fact that he blocked, he blacked her out yeah. made her famous. Yes. So it had yes. the opposite effect. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, for 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 decades, I've pronounced her name Fannie Lou Hamer. And you're and, still and, doing and, it. And I know, and I still <laughs> do it now. It's Fannie Lou Hamer. Hamer. But I'm telling you, there's something going on in this head right here. Jackson, that she Mississippi. She had such a hammer. She was yeah. so powerful mm -hmm. and so yeah. strong. But I'm going to try to remember. Fannie Lou Hamer. Hamer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so she heard that. Jemiah heard that. She heard her describing the beatings and the, the, how blood was flowing in the jails and they were throwing them in them. She heard the whole story. And after that, she said, I just felt the pain. And that's when she really understood what, what the story behind what she was saying. Because she ends it, if you remember, by saying, is this America? Yeah. Where you have to take your phone off the hook in order to keep them being threatened because all you really want to do is go vote. And to be yeah. free, yeah. And, and yeah. sometimes what it is, it's three different parts. Those are three different pieces of mm -hmm. things that, that uh, Fannie Lou Hamer talked about. Mm -hmm. So it's not all straight in context there so, so that mm -hmm. we could tie it into what, when we do the vignette, we're trying to tie in the characters as we move through the piece. And the three pieces and are? The three pieces are. So there was the piece that when she was, you know, at the, at the committee. Yeah. And then the other piece was when she was talking about when she was being beaten. Mm -hmm. um, and then also talking about when she was started with SNCC. Mm -hmm. So those are the pieces. And mm -hmm. she's the writer. Yeah. So yeah. people often ask me who does that. She yeah. does it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we go back yeah. and forth and talk, and I do the come, you know, the historical whatever. But then yeah. she puts all of that together. You know, and as we sit here at this table, at Howard University, what I call the greatest institution of higher learning. Of course you do. In the history of the world. And I agree. Uh, there you go. That's another Howard grad there over there. There you go. Absolutely. <clears throat> but we hear. Fannie Lou Hammer, talking to those who beat her down to the ground, who bloody her, who hit her upside, of her upside her head, and she's still talking with a sense of humanity. That's some, just some incredible power that I saw brought to life by these kids on that stage uh, uh, just a little bit ago when, when, when we saw that. Um, now, Another piece of my journey home with my family, I had kids in the car with me, relatives, that went from eight years old to just 13 years old. And my sense of them, because I don't get to spend nearly as much time with them as I like, that they like music, they like movies, they like cartoons, they like to dress, but they don't pay much attention to what's going on in the world. And I was extraordinarily disabused of that thought when they, each of them talked about, no, when I saw them react to your vignette from the ladies in Hidden Figures, I'm watching them and each of them I realized must have seen the movie because the visceral reaction that they had when they saw the depiction on stage was something that warmed my heart. And again, going home, when each of them talked about how the kids in Blacks and Wax had perfected the characters mm -hmm. in Hidden Figures, mm -hmm. that was extraordinarily pleasing to Grandpa, to Uncle Rock. Mm -hmm. Let's see right here. Mary Jackson, one of the black female engineers featured in the Hidden Figures film is Kaya Anderson. She had a love for science and a commitment to help people improve their lives. Mary Jackson graduated from Hampton Institute in 1942 with a dual degree in math and physical sciences. She was a pistol and her work career led her 
to Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory's segregated West Area Computing Section in 1951, reporting to none other than Dorothy Vaughn, the group's supervisor. After two years in the computing pool, she received the offer that she always wanted, that she truly deserved, to work for engineer Kazimir Rezanicki in the four foot by four foot supersonic pressure tunnel. Zanicki offered her hands-on experience conducting experiments. He eventually suggested that she enter a training program that would help her get a promotion from a mathematician to an engineer, her ultimate dream. That journey didn't come without a challenge. Mary had to get special permission to take night classes at the all-white Hampton High School. Hmm, Mary never ran from a challenge. She got that permission and she passed those classes and earned that promotion in 1965, becoming NASA's first black female engineer. Here's what I have to ask, Shiva. Let me, let me go directly to you on this. This little girl grew up in Southeast Washington, D.C. She just spoke with a pronounced <laughs> Southern accent. <laughs> yes. Please tell me how you got her there. <laughs> she did it herself. She got there herself. She did some character study and she she started using it. And then, but you know, once you do something like that, yeah. then we really push you. We're yeah, like, you really okay, do. well, uh -huh. bring it. Uh -huh. And we need to make sure we still understand the words, but bring it. And uh -huh. so she did. And uh -huh. she sings. Mm -hmm. So she had two parts in this particular vignette. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she did. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because when we came in here this evening, um, the kids were very polite and very mm -hmm. respectful practicing decorum just that mm -hmm. er, anyone would be proud of. And I was like, you know, <clears throat> when kids are like this, they normally are hungry. And she said, yeah, I'm hungry. And it, was, <laughs> it, had, <laughs> it, it had that Southern twist. Really? She was in, she was in character. In character. She, yeah. was, she was in character. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, we ask them to stay there. As long. Matter of fact, they're all still in character until the rap party. Mm -hmm. So Really? <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Uh -huh. Which we are very support, very help, <laughs> uh, very, very grateful for your support yeah. every year. Yeah. Rather you realize they it They stay not. there. I mean, we have to say, okay. Yeah. Especially with we like, had to do it because yeah. after the first year. Yeah. They walked around actively thinking they were Frederick Douglass. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, we got to have something. We got to bring them down. Uh -huh. We got to say that was really yeah. good, but you were acting, Over. and now you're not that. So, so that's how the rap I, party was. A time there. to decompress. Yeah. Uh-huh. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you, 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 you speak of that support, and each time that I see this, I just am more inspired than I than I was the time before. I just keep thinking, you know, it can't get any better. Mm -hmm. And then you go to see it, and I just keep trying to spread the word. You may or may not know that, you know, I start this program here talking about we hope to introduce our audience to stories and people that uh, are inspiring. And I just find that what what you all are doing and how you're developing these kids here, who, as your ex-husband would say, the least of the, those that are forgotten, you know, those that need a voice because they have no voice, to, to be able to see them gain their own voice and gain a vision through what is going on is something that I'm just more than happy to be able to introduce my audience to in, in hopes that in, in, in years coming that, you know, they would support you, they would come out and, and, and see these kids and bring their kids to see them. Yeah. You know, I really appreciate that, Rock, because it is, a, as long as we've been doing it, it still doesn't have the profile that it really should have. And mm -hmm. a lot of people regret not going to it after they've heard about it yeah. or seen some clips. Yeah. And uh, I was in a meeting with a potential funder the other day, and she asked me, what is the difference between what you all do here and what other tennis facilities do? I said, we do more than just give them a tennis racket and help them with their homework. We go deep. Mm -hmm. We develop character. We change trajectories. We do uh, uh, robotics, uh, computer science, sewing, and then we do blacks and wax, which is not just a historical 
uh, journey for them, but it's a journey in building them to a point that they can use it for the rest of their lives. That takes a lot of love, that takes a lot of time, takes a lot of commitment, it takes a lot of investment. What we go through, you can't pay us. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. just can't pay could, us. Couldn't could, pay you enough for what yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and let me say. And mm -hmm. all the staff at the Southeast Sure, Center sure. Center, and you know, just uh, um, uh, that its reputation, the, your, 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 your facility's reputation has developed to a point where you are getting some folks that are paying attention and giving testimony like Venus and Serena Williams. Mm -hmm. You know, I looked up just over my shoulder when I was at the play, and I see Alexis Herman. Alexis Herman, <clears throat> who's on the board of the MGM, former Secretary of Labor, of Secretary of Labor mm -hmm. under Bill Clinton, and you know, people are really starting to pay attention. And you guys have performed at the Kennedy Center every year, except this year. Yeah. And at the White House, how was that? How was that? How was it performing at the White House? Well, I think for the, it was exciting for the kids for sure to be at the White House. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and you know when we're not able to take you two all are of such them. veterans of high society. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't excited at the right? <laughs> Well, excuse me. We're, <laughs> yes, we're, we remain excited at yeah. that time. We yeah. were excited not to go anymore. to yeah. the White House. Not now. And so, <laughs> <laughs> not, not in 2017. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, that was before. Uh -huh. And um, but it is, it's, and it's really just good to see the journey for them. For you know, they they're really this, and this has taken them not just to the White House. It's also taken them to other cities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, around the country. We mm -hmm. haven't gone to all the country yet, but we have been in other cities mm -hmm. around the country. So well, right now, that. as you talk about, you know, not being excited about the White House and what's going on there right now, part of the question on the opposite side of the aisle, the Democratic side, is who is going to be the person that could possibly emerge to channel uh, sort of this energy that has developed uh, on the Republican side? And oftentimes when you have that discussion, uh, a name com comes up. And it's a guy from, the, as he calls, the beautiful state of New Jersey. And so we have young Kevin Akers in his depiction of the former mayor and now senator from New Jersey, Cory Booker. Our founding documents, they weren't genius because they were perfect. They were sad with the imperfections and, yes, the bigotry of the past. Native Americans, they were referred to as savages. Black Americans, we were fractions of human beings. And women weren't even mentioned at all. But those facts and ugly parts of our nation's history, they do not distract from our nation's greatness. In fact, I believe we are an even greater nation, not because we started perfect, but because every generation has successfully labored to make us a more perfect union. America, we need each other. We as a nation are better together. When we are divided, we are weak, we decline. Yet when we are united, we are strong. And when we are indivisible, we are simply invincible. But I know one thing for sure. You must be connected with the people in order to really serve the people. And I am here to serve the people as I have my entire career, first as Newark, New Jersey's mayor for over seven years, and right now as the first African-American senator from the beautiful state of New Jersey. I know times may be tough right now, but as my favorite author, Maya Angelou, wrote, you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may even trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I rise. We will rise. Cory Booker could only wish <laughs> that he was as handsome as this. <laughs> that he was as handsome as this kid. And but and what this kid had is, I mean, did you have to like look far and wide for? Because Cory Booker has big hands, <laughs> and he's got mannerism. He talk, he speaks with his hands. This boy nailed it. He did, and what's funny about him is he—he uh, he was trying. He was trying. He's been a couple of different characters, from you know, president, to right, to president. I think Barack Obama. Obama and I mean, and from uh, right, uh -huh. and so he 
uh, but you have to, he has to be careful not to portray them the same way. Yeah. And so, you know, he was kind of stuck for a second. And then I said, you need to go away and look at it, look him up some more. Look, and he said, you know, I realized I talk just like him already. <laughs> uh <-huh. And> so, <laughs> he, you know, he went to himself and he, he found it. Yeah. And Cory Booker, a, a, that depiction of Cory Booker talking, um, and he ended with the, um, obviously, his admiration for Maya Angelou. And Cory, I am going to try to lean on you for a moment here. Um, you might not say this, but I'll make the observation. I don't think there were a lot of people closer to Maya Angelou and Dorothy Height than you were. If you would take a moment as we're doing this, because we're, we're looking through a historical lens here. If you would take a moment and just share a few reflections on Maya Angelou. You know, I think the thing about Maya, I always, when people ask me that about her or Dorothy, I always try to think of things that people don't know about them. Mm -hmm. We know she was a great orator, a great writer but she was so connected to the every, everyday person. Quick story, when I was coming to uh, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina with my kids, some of my kids from the center to do a couple of pro uh, to, uh, pro programs, and so I, she said, well, when are you coming to visit me? I said, well, I've got to deal with these kids and it'll be tomorrow, bring them over. I said, bring them over. She said, yeah, bring them over. I brought the kids to her house, they swam in her pool, they ate her pound cake, they drank her iced tea, and I had programmed them, please have your manners be blah, 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 yeah. act, don't mm -hmm. act like you got some sense. <laughs> One of the little girls looked at her and said, Dr. Maya, I like your stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, there goes my trainer. Yeah. And she just fell out laughing. Yeah. So she, she loved connecting with everyday people. Mm -hmm. she, she, come, she came off as grand, but mm -hmm. she was really a person with a common touch. Or a, a true organic humanity. Mm -hmm. A girl, organic person. And, yeah. like the, and like the authentic people much more than the big famous people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we just don't have enough <clears throat> time to do all we want to do here. So what we're going to do now is um, I think undoubtedly when one thinks about uh, actors in, in our community, um, probably the first person that comes to mind is the iconic Oscar winner, Denzel Washington. And Mr. Dre Falk stepped up and gave us his depiction of D. Here we go. August Wilson, is one of the greatest playwrights in the history of American or world theater. It is a privilege, an honor, a responsibility, a duty, and a joy to bring his brilliance to the screen with fences. I am particularly proud and happy about the young filmmakers, actors, writers, and producers coming up behind my generation in particular, Barry Jenkins. He made 15 to 20 short films before we got a hit with Moonlight. So never give up. Without commitment, you'll never start. But more importantly, without consistency, you'll never finish. It's not easy. If it were easy, there'd be no Kerry Washington. If it were easy, there'd be no Taraji P. Henson. If it were easy, there'd be no Octavia Spencer, but not only that, if it were easy, there'd be no Viola Davis. If it were easy, there'd be no Michael T. Williamson, no Stephen McKinley Henderson, no Russell Hornsby. If it were easy, there'd be no Denzel Washington. So keep working, keep striving, never give up, fall down seven times, get up eight. Ease is a greater threat to progress than hardship. So, keep moving, keep going, keep learning. See you at work. <laughs> oh man, I can see that boy in Training Day, American Gangster, Malcolm X, Reuben Hurricane Carter. <laughs> when I think about those movies now, I might see his face. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he rocked it. Yeah. Did he, um, tell us about his, 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 his getting there. Well, <laughs> he, he shocked us. 
and he stayed consistent like that. One of the reasons I think he shocked us is because we've had a journey with Dre, another one who's been there for I don't know how many years. Eight Dre. years old, Eight. he was our first Michael Jackson. Yeah. Mm. And, mm -hmm. and I think the year before, last year, he just kind of worked on the crew, and the other year, we kicked him out. So uh -huh. <laughs> when he came so back had, in, so, so, so we, he's, had he's, had some, he's had some history mm -hmm. with us. And so mm -hmm. when he came in, and we said, do this part, and he did it, and then, you know, but he just kept looking and kept, and that is, he I mean. He did character study. Right, he mm -hmm. did great character study. I mean, mm -hmm. and there was nothing to do, I mean, that was, you know, Denzel Washington's speech, mm -hmm. it's perfection, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Nothing, I just mm -hmm. paste, copy and pasted it and said, mm -hmm. now if you deliver it, you got it because he delivered it. Mm -hmm. and, and as I told him, that not only did he deliver it, but if he lives by it. Yeah. I said, think of the words you're saying. And if yeah. you think about those words and put those words in action in your life, he'll, nothing you can't do. Tell me, about, um, tell me about the good and the bad of the community and parents' involvement, lack thereof, support. Well, I don't know the bad. Or, well, I don't know the good and the bad. The parents of the kids who are in this, with a few exceptions, were all in. They didn't know exactly how to be all in, okay. but as we guided them, they were. They, mm -hmm. I said it at the beginning. I'm very, very mm -hmm. direct and, and mm -hmm. even maybe even harsh mm -hmm. when it comes to parents because mm -hmm. I know how parents can be. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to make the sacrifice, if you don't want the kids to stay late, if you don't want the kids to uh, learn their parts, you have to be a part of it. If you're not going to do that, they can't do it. Mm -hmm. They cannot do it without you. So I said that at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we were able to pull on that when things got shaky because near the last two weeks, it'd be like three, four, five hours of, of rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And I don't want nobody standing in the back talking about I got to go home. Okay. So what they did, though, which is a, that's never done before, they formed their own committee, and st which, of course, was our default, start feeding the kids. So mm. they, each parent would take a day mm -hmm. and bring the spaghetti dinner or mm -hmm. the pizza or mm -hmm. the sandwiches for the kids who had to, who had to uh, work late. So they did that. For the last two weeks, mm -hmm. so I really, I really appreciated that, and I was really amazed by it. So you guys <clears throat> would reject, with all the fiber DNA in your being, those comments that a certain presidential candidate made when he talked to the black community and said, "What do you gotta, what, what do you gotta lose?" As if the black community is monolithic and there is no hope, there is no activity, there is no recreation, there is no development, there is no, uh, uh, there is no evolving in that black community. You all reject that. You, you, you live a life where you are able to reject that. There's nobody on planet Earth, starting with him, that love their kids anymore and these people love their kids. They do all they can, all that they know to do, they do it. And they love their kids, mm -hmm. and they want the best for them, and I don't even know what he's talking about. Sheba? I just think that um, if there could be a Southeast Tennessee Learning Center, you know, in all the communities, it would be great, obviously, across the country. Um, we don't have that every place, but where this one sits and lies, uh, those parents are, are involved, and it's showing up in the kids, mm -hmm. be when the, even when they, particularly when they leave. Mm -hmm. you know, while they're there, when they leave. Mm -hmm. You, not so long ago, had a tremendous expansion of the facility. Um, is it correct that George Washington University, you have a relationship with it's George Washington home, it's University? Their home, <coughs> it's their home uh, site. Mm -hmm. That's where they play all their matches, and that's mm -hmm. where they do all their, uh, mm -hmm. their practices. So George Washington University, for those who are not familiar, mm -hmm. sits down a few blocks a very White prestigious House. area mm -hmm. from the White House. But the White House has come to the hood because the hood got something real good. And therefore, over there. Harvard University mm -hmm. and, and James Mason and all the other colleges come to the hood because they played them at the Southeast Tennyson Learning Center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear the president watches television all the time. Perhaps he's watching what's going on here today. We would like for him to do that. That would just be so special. Depicting activist Tamika Mallory at the D.C. Women's March is Adora Tobias. Just before, we, just before we go to her, we should put that in perspective, that this march happened the day after the current administration's inauguration. And there were literally millions of people 
uh, all over the world who were participating and the numbers that were here, I don't know if anybody has accurately counted them, but it was in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions here. And this name, Tamika Mallory, that not so many people are aware of yet, but is an emerging, inter not just national, but international leader. And Adoria Tobias brings her to us right now. I'm Tamika Mallory, one of the co-organizers of the first ever Women's March on this unprecedented date, January 21st, just one day after the inauguration of the 45th President of the United States. To those of you who for the first time felt the pain that my people have felt since they were brought here with chains shackled on our legs. Today, I say to you, welcome to my world. Welcome to our world. America cannot be great without me, you, and all of us who are here today. I say thank you to my sisters Carmen Perez and Linda Sarsour. We've been in this together, and we are so grateful for those women who stand behind us, who are forging the way for this new generation of movement shakers. This is a constant fight, and we must continue to press this administration and all administrations that do not respect or represent women. Thank you, Cora Masters Berry, Melanie Campbell, and Reverend Dr. Barbara William Skinner, who stand with us today and who have paved the way in their own way. And to all those women who put in the work to make this march a reality, who have sacrificed family, work, and who knows what else, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. But I have a special shout out to my girl, Bob Bland. That's right. My girl, Bob Bland, she thought this up and thought it only right to make sure that women of color were in the forefront. This was a grassroots effort, but I think Bob called it a horizontal approach to leadership. She told us we need to form a resistance movement that's about what is positive, something that will help empower us to wake up in the morning and feel that women still matter. Women still matter. Say it again and again and again. Um, so. All uh, four. Yeah. I said <clears throat> before, I tried to put this piece in some context by saying that this Women's March was the day after this administration's inauguration. <clears throat> um, Obviously, Corey, you were there and you were on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, you were on stage with uh, the organizers. Mm -hmm. You're on stage with Alicia Keys. You're on stage, I saw you right there uh, with uh, Madonna, uh, who made some strong, <laughs> some say inflammatory uh, uh, comments. Mm -hmm. For those in our audience who might not have seen the news report, might not have seen uh, what was going on that day, the day after the inauguration. If you could take us back there and give us a glimpse of what it felt like being there that day. Well, it was magical for me because I was on the stage, but more importantly, Sheba was there and she was in the march where the masses were. Mm -hmm. So I, her experience is really fascinated me because I was sort of in a bubble. So uh -huh. I'd like to hear okay. sort of. Okay, I'd, like, I'd love to hear that, but then I still want to come back <laughs> here. Well, I think that th what was important um, f for me is to really see, you know, what was this movement? What were we going to see? So many different women mm -hmm. uh, who were really coming to express their voices, uh, which is another place where we got the title as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that it was women of, you know, all different generations or children there were mm -hmm. there were men there were men too of course mm -hmm. and you know the women you know some of the songs that popped up organically you know wearing of the hats uh, so when Mrs. Grace said she wanted to do um, 
this march, you wanted those women featured. Um, you know, it's always about how do we try to put this thing together so all these people um, make sense, mm -hmm. you know. And so we took a take on, yes, you know, no more, um, well, what is it? Hidden um, figures. The hidden figures, mm -hmm. but we came with no more hidden voices mm -hmm. you, unite so that we could bring all this together. And um, because I felt that that's what was happening, that the women were coming together, not just women, but also men. Mm -hmm. So um, it, was it was a great experience to be able to really say, ha, let's put this piece in there because it ties into what we're doing. And then being there, mm -hmm. that feeling. That feeling was overwhelming. Uh, that thing was overwhelming, you know, some anxious moments because it was a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of us very close together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people waiting because everyone's like, well, are we marching? When are we marching? Well, the march was it, mm -hmm. being there and that close because there was no place to go mm -hmm. because it was full of women. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it was a sense of pride, a sense of, you know, here we are, you know, hear our voices, see our faces. Mm -hmm. This is important to and us. And the signs were amazing. The what? The, the signs. signs. Yeah. I love the signs. Yeah. On the stage, though, which, which a lot of people don't know, there were many, many politicians and, and celebrities who never you never saw on camera. Mm -hmm. They were just there in support. Mm -hmm. You never saw Cher. <coughs> mm -hmm. Cher was there forever, but mm -hmm. they, she never got up in front of anybody. Mm -hmm. They were just there for support. Steny Hoare, I can just think of many congressmen and senators who just showed up. The governor of um, Terry McAuliffe, the governor of Virginia, they mm -hmm. were all on stage, but mm -hmm. they never were on front. Mm -hmm. um, um, when, as a scholar, I know you say you were there in the bubble. As a, as a scholar and an activist, what was your reaction? Because first of all, you know, for some period of time, you know, it looked like, you know, you and Madonna were seriously girls. Y'all were, so, were so close together. So when Ma Ma got, Madonna got up and, you know, full letter her word, full letter word through her, her speech, what were you thinking? You know, I guess, the day after the inauguration, we were all traumatized. It didn't really bother me until the next day uh -huh. when I got the reaction. Right. As a, well, a lot of that was being said. It just wasn't said on the microphone. <laughs> so she just said it on the microphone. <laughs> so I was like, wow. okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. um, so let me lean on you and your social science historical uh, background again <clears throat> and ask, We go through these historical figures. Um, I remember, you know, hearing you talk and wax poetic uh, about thinking that uh, Linda Baines Johnson was our greatest president. And you articulated your reasons why. From a social scientist point of view, from a citizen's point of view who lives here in Washington, D.C., we're coming up on 100 days, so just past 100 days of the, uh, of the current administration. What are your, what are your observations? Well, um, before I do that, say, talk about that, I just want to mention that the four organizers of the march on Washington, the Women's March, mm -hmm. were actually at Blacks and Wax. Uh -huh. They all four came. I just really want to make sure that people know that. Uh -huh. Bob Bland, Tamika Mallory, Linda Sensor, and Carmen Perez. Uh -huh. For the first time, they were together in Washington since that march. Wow. They came because they came That's to see special. themselves be back. That is special. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, this is all uncharted territory. I think it's all going to end up wrong because at the end of the day, regardless of what we may think of this country, the Constitution does work. And one of the things that the now president is beginning to understand, and maybe he doesn't, no one told him, there is three branches of government, and they all have separation of powers, and they have checks and balances. But the most powerful branch of government is the courts. Mm -hmm. The courts can check the legislator and can check the executive. And the only way that the legislator can overturn the courts is by some crazy number, like you have to have 70%. Right, right. So the courts are checking him. <coughs> mm -hmm all over the country for mm -hmm. in different levels for different things. Mm -hmm. So I think that at the end of the day, people are going to have to pay their dues. They're going to have to answer to some very high treason things that are coming out. Mm -hmm. It's not going to turn out right because at the end of the day, nobody gets away with it. Mm -hmm. um, 
the in, because you're sitting there, and I, because I have no no doubt that um, the audience that we speak to on a regular basis um, has a great deal of appreciation for your former husband. Uh, it's, not my, it's just my past, my husband. My, my I'm the middle. It's not my former husband. He mm. ex. Yeah, you, no, he's not actually dead. Oh, he's still husband. <laughs> yeah, he's my, he's still uh -huh. my husband. He's just. I passed out. I don't know uh -huh. how you call it. Y'all still, okay. Yeah, we were still, You still got something going on. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. We'll, ta we'll take that. We're okay. We'll, we'll, right. we'll take that. Um, <laughs> uh, there has been a, uh, a an, an effort, a wide group of people have come together to uh, pay tribute uh, to, to Marion. Tell us about that uh, in terms of what's happening with the uh, his uh, statue. Uh, I know that these, his grave site has... Uh, been um, been seriously enhanced. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a great monument. The city has uh, commissioned and approved an eight foot statue of Marion Brown statue that will stand in front of City Hall, mm -hmm. where he wanted to be on Pennsylvania Avenue mm -hmm. on Thirteenth and a half. So when you come up, he's going to be waving at you. No, no knowing Marion Barry the way that I knew Marion Barry, the fact that there is an eight foot statue, eight foot. he just ain't going to stop smiling. No, he's happy. He's very happy. <laughs> That's uh, that, that 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 that's that's great to know, and you you got you got good support for that. Well, starting with the mayor, mm -hmm. Mayor Mayor Bowser, she supported it, and and all the way down the line, we're waiting on the city council to get their approval, <coughs> to wait for Phil Mendelson. We have one little glitch, and we, he's the one who will make that call, and I'm gonna make a call to him, and I'm sure it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, something else on Marion, we'll, we'll we'll ask you about, um. Because we never know when we're going to have you back, and I'd rather take the opportunity to ask why we got you here. Uh, what do you think? In let's say, if you could give me a minute, minute and a half answer, uh, is Marion Barry's legacy? Well, it's not even a minute and a half. He did so much for so many for so long. I mean, he did the least of us, and he empowered people. Many of the people who live in the neighborhood that she lives in. Uh, there and uh, Prince George's got their fortune and their and their um, their life's uh, fortune from working and doing business and being able to operate in Washington. Most people talk about their first job. Obviously, it's a great place to grow old in because seniors are queen and kings in Washington D.C. And of course, the hallmark of all summer youth programs from there. She called, she's named it now the Mary and Barry Youth Summer Employment. Uh, program where over millions of people have been employed down through the years through his program and it's been replicated all over the country so youth children I'm sorry youth seniors and uh, 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 employ and um, business people black business people who got their fair share because the city was locked down when he got there and he opened it up mm -hmm. to uh, to young folks and to those who weren't really familiar with the mayor uh, I think we might want to take that as a cliff, as a form of education to those that might be just moving uh, into the city and wonder what all the fuss is about Marion S. Barry from Itabina. Mississippi. M Itabina, Mississippi. Yeah. Um, folks, <clears throat> that wraps us for this evening. For more information on this program or any other program produced by WHUT, Go to WHUT.org. Now, I'll let Zora Lawson close us out here. That's Tamara's daughter and Cora's granddaughter. Here's her depiction of Alicia Keys at the DC's Women March. Goodbye and God bless and watch Zora rock this. Ladies and gentlemen, are you still here? Yeah. If you're ready to march, say yeah. Yeah. You will not allow our compassion and souls to get stepped on. We want the best for all Americans. No hate, no bigotry, no Muslim registry. We value education and health care and equality. We continue to rise until our voices are heard, until our planet safety is not deferred, until our bums stop dropping other lands, until our dollar is the same dollar as a man's. And we continue to recognize that, yes, we can. 
until everyone respects Mother Energy and everyone in the Mother Bulletin must agree. So I need you to repeat after me. We are here. We are here. We're on fire. We're on fire. Be on the ground. Be on the ground. Not backing down. Not backing down. Feet on the ground. Feet on the ground. Not backing down. Not backing down. This girl is on fire. This girl is on fire. We're walking the fire. These girls are on fire. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.